So first up today, I'd like to introduce Kevin Martin. He's the current president for uh, Oregon Foundation of North American Wild Sheep. Okay, you've got one place. Good morning. You guys all hear me? Good. Well, welcome. And congratulations on drawing a coveted tag. Uh, sheep and goats, uh, that's, that's pretty unique. And, and, I, and I assume most of you really know what you have in your, in your hands. Uh, the Oregon uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Oregon Foundation of North American Wild Sheep would like to assist you in making sure that your, your hunt is rewarding um, and, mem and a memor mem memorial mem memorable experience. Uh, more coffee, I guess, or maybe less. You know, it's really good to look out here and see people after the last year. Uh, I think we got a really good turnout this year, and, I, and, and that, a lot of that has to do, I think, with people who are tired of not being out. And so it's, it's wonderful to see, to see all the folks that showed up. So I'm going to first, first start off with a little bit of a quick advertisement for Oregon Foundation for North American Wild Sheep, or Oregon FNAS. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit corporation founded in 1999 as a chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation. Uh, and since our beginning, we've raised over a million dollars for bighorn sheep and, and Mount Rocky Mountain goat projects that are on the ground in mostly in the state of Oregon. Uh, we work with a lot of government agencies. We work with a lot of volunteer organizations. And we have contributed and part partnered on many worthwhile projects. Um, we've done a lot. We've participated in, in, in transplant uh, and translocations uh, all across the West. Uh, we've, we, we are very engaged in disease and re disease research and disease management. Uh, I, I assume when, you, when, when the folks start talking about uh, particularly the, the bighorn sheep, uh, they'll share a little bit about the disease issues out there. We, we assist in funding radio tracking, telemetry, predation work, uh, working with uh, agencies on uh, domestic, domestic sheep allotments. Uh, population surveys, water catchments, and a year like this, water is a really important thing, as hot and dry as it's been. Uh, weed projects, uh, and then we actively in, are engaged with all the agencies, federal, state, local agencies, in planning efforts that may or could affect, positively or negatively, uh, bighorn sheep and Rocky Mountain goats, just to name a few. So I think you, when you walked in the door, you were uh, told that you know tag holders would get a first you know, free year uh, membership in Oregon FNAS. Uh We would love to have you make sure you go on and sign up for that. We'd love to have you guys be members. Uh, we'd like to have you be longtime members uh, and part participate in all the, the really interesting things we get to do because all these on the ground projects, um, many of us uh, members uh, participate in that and it can be really rewarding. Um, and if you know anybody else out there, that would be, that would be good too. So. And, and many of you are, you know, it's once in a lifetime tag, you're gonna get, have a wonderful hunt. You're gonna have, take tons and tons of pictures. Uh, and we'd love to see those. We'd love to hear your stories and we'd love to be able to share those uh, on our newsletter, on our, our social media sites, uh, if, if, if you're willing to share those with us. Cause it's, it uh, helps bring in membership, brings in support by uh, sharing those kinds of stories besides Folks like myself who have never drawn a tag, uh, we just put in for tags every year. Uh, we kind of live through the rest of you that do. So your stories are pretty important for us to, uh, so it's, so, so Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep, or Rocky Mountain Goat and Bighorn Sheep hunts. Uh, many of you, you know, I've, talk, I've wandered around and talked to many of you, and there's a lot of veteran hunters and seasoned hunters in the group. Um, this is really tough country. This is a really rare tag, uh, and it's really special. And, and again, we want to do everything possible to ensure that you have a great hunting experience and a successful harvest. It's different than any kind of hunt you ever have, and that tag, that lifetime, once-in-a-lifetime tag is, is really something. So uh, we, we hope that you all uh, recognize that, uh, because we do, and uh, we, want to, we want to make that successful. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, since it's a once in a lifetime tag, most of you probably haven't been out on a sheep or a goat hunt. Uh, you may have been lucky enough to go with someone else, uh, which, which many of us do, because that's an opportunity to get to be involved. Uh, but uh, without a lot of experience, uh, it can be difficult to know, you know, how old is that ram? How old is that billy? You know, how big is that? Um, you know, 
what's what, what might be that score out there and, and, and is, is it a trophy or not uh, would it be in a book or not uh, I guess I would suggest that any sheep or goat that you get is a trophy and, it, and, and you'll you'll live that hunt and you'll live that forever but uh, we want to help you try to figure out what that looks like uh, and, and so that you can again get the best and largest that you can get so we want to want to help you in that <laughs> So we've got a lot of information that we're going to share with you today. Um, a lot, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about the animals, but we'll also be talking about the habitat and the, and the hunting uh, complexities that you're going to, going to face out there. It's really extremely rugged ground. I've talked to some of you again, and you've been out scouting, uh, and so you know uh, it's really rugged country and it's really difficult to get into. Um, and, and, and you need to be really prepared for that. It's it's a you know a mental challenge and a physical challenge both uh, to to hunt, and it's really unique to both these species, sheep and goats. Uh, so this is a great this orientation is a great way and and, and it is a great way to get together. Uh, we get to get together with you all. Uh, we get to share information. Or you see the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, insignia around here. It's great to see all those guys out as well. Uh, after the last year, uh, but they they're the, they're, they know the ground where you're going to. You're, you're stationed at, uh, place at, at in your hunt areas, and those biologists will tie in with you uh, and sit down with you today. You'll get to know their names. You can ask them some questions. You can pour over some maps, uh, and, and that'll build that relationship that you can carry on all the way through your hunt in, in, in communications with those with those folks. Our members will be there too. We have um, Oregon Fanaz board members. Raise your hand so folks can see who you are. Because most, many of us have shirts on, but not all of us. Uh, so you can see them kind of around the back. We'll be around as well. Uh, and many of the folks uh, in our organization come into our organization, become board members because they had such a great experience hunting uh, their sheep or their goat or both. Uh, and and uh, so they have a wealth of information as well. And the interesting thing you'll find about hunters on sheep and goats is, you know, when, when you're talking about your elk place or your deer place, you know, you kind of keep that pretty close to the, to the vest because, you know, you're going back out there and you're going to, you know, that's your hunting spot. Sheep and goat, you'll find out sheep and goat hunters aren't that way once. They get one, one shot at it, so it's not like they're... They're, they're, most of them are really willing to tell their stories, really willing, willing to share those information. So when you get together, you'll be sitting with other hunters that are out there that you can coordinate and collaborate with, because there's only a few of you in many of these units, and so you'll know who that other person is. That can be useful when you're out there, as well as uh, past hunters who are willing to share their information. Uh, we are recording uh, this online so that you can go back and, and look at this again. Uh, through, you know, if, there, if there's information that, that you want to, uh, to look at. And, and then there's some folks didn't, weren't, weren't, allowed, weren't, weren't able to make it, and so they will um, uh, be able to look at it as well. Um, I want, uh, in addition to the state bios that are around, you know, there's a lot of these places are on federal grounds, Forest Service, BLM, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife properties. They have biologists, they have maps, and they have information as well. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, I haven't seen any folks here from those agencies, there may be, uh, but that's another choice, that's another piece of information. They have some great maps uh, and things that you can get as well as, you know, many of you go online and get some of the really good maps and things as well. Um, so this is a great get together. Um, we're going to have a good time today. We'll have a lunch. Uh, a quick lunch and then we've got our first ever mountain hunters rendezvous at the Deschutes River State Park. Uh, going to have steaks and, and food and, 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 and it'll be an opportunity for anybody that wants to come out there as well uh, and, and join us. So uh, we want to invite you to join, to join us out there and then we can bend your arms a little bit more to become Oregon FNAS members. Um, so if you have questions today, uh, ask them this is a great opportunity write down those 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 uh, uh, agency folks contacts the other hunters in your unit contact information so that you can you can uh, get with them and and again congratulations on your once in a lifetime hunt and uh, we hope each of you have a fabulous hunt and with that I'm going to pass it back to Jeremy wherever he went and he will get us moving through the rest of the agenda thank you
Thanks, Kevin. So our first speaker today is Larry Jacobs. Larry's been on the Oregon FNAS board for, for a lot of years. He's also on the National Wild Sheep Foundation board. Um, wealth of knowledge about all things sheep. What he's going to share with you today is really the aspects that he thinks about when it gets to coming into sheep shape and being ready for your hunt. So you can use here, or you can use here. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to talk about sheep hunting without at least mentioning uh, getting in some kind of shape uh, for sheep hunting. It's pretty rugged country. Uh, Um, I've, I've got some pictures kind of distributed throughout this talk, and it's, uh, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but, um, you know, most of this country is steep, you know, it's, it's, it's rugged, um, and it, it takes at least some kind of conditioning, you know, to, to get, move around in this, in this type of uh, country. Uh, in talking about uh, sheep shape or, or getting in shape for either sheep hunting or, or goat hunting, um, I like to break it down uh, into four aspects, and that's cardio, strength, agility, and stamina. Um, and I think the, the main thing you need to do here is kind of evaluate yourself in respect to these goals and then train your weakness. I mean, it's, it's you know, we're all, you know, shaped a little bit different. Um, some of us are a little bit older than others, so I think evaluate yourself and and, and train accordingly. So uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, cardio, um, you know, anything that uh, is going to raise your heart rate for a, for a, a good length of time, uh, you, know, any, you know, any kind of running, jogging, swimming, you know, uh, any type of a workout that you can do, you know, maybe three times a week um, and build that, get that heart going and, and stuff is going to help with your, with your cardio fitness. So, uh, you know, I would suggest at least, you know, getting out, um, maybe doing, you know, some scouting and try and do enough, enough of a workout to where you're going to get your heart rate going a little bit, a little bit better. So, um, strength, um, uh, Strength is it was really helpful too. You know, build those legs up. You know, you know, get the, get that back those back muscles uh, built up. Uh, you know, you know any kind of uh, any kind of training that's that's uh, you know going to help with that is is you know would really be helpful. If, if nothing else, I mean, you know, put that pack on and throw a bunch of water in that pack and and get out in that country where you're going to be hunting and and do some hill climbing and you know you can always if it's if it gets to be a bit much you can always uh, dump water but this time of year usually with as warm as it is uh, you can probably end up drinking that water before uh, before you're done so um, okay thirdly uh, would be uh, agility um, you know, if you're if you're out there starting your workout do a little bit of stretching once you get warmed up a little bit uh, you know, you know, hiking some of that really rugged stuff, uh, you know, on uneven ground or something with a pack, and and that all seems to to really help with with agility. Uh, again, I've got you know a number of pictures you know dispersed between here and some of this bighorn sheep habitat, and you can see how how rugged and steep most of this habitat is. So uh, get out there and do what you can. Um, Stamina would be kind of the sum total of, of all the conditioning. Um, you know, push yourself a little bit if you're, if you're uh, working your way up a, a slope or something and uh, you seem like you want to take a rest or something, push yourself and go another 10 or 20 steps and stuff before you, uh, before you stop and sit down and rest or something. And that'll, that'll sure, certainly help you, uh, you know, to build up your stamina. Uh, Again, uh, take into consideration the area you're going to be hunting. Um, evaluate yourself uh, in respect to the goals, your goals, and, and again, train your weakness. Uh, design a workout that's going to be effective for what you're wanting to achieve. Uh, that's going to, you know, fit within your, your situation. Uh, 
Most importantly, get into the area where you have a tag and, and do lots of hi hiking, uh, lots of scouting. Uh, you know, the other thing that uh, is really important when it comes to, uh, to sheep hunting is uh, mental toughness. And, and I'm going to turn it over now for a few minutes uh, to Don South that will talk a little bit about uh, mental toughness. So, Don? Don is on, on the uh, Oregon board also, and he'll, he'll talk a little bit on mental toughness. How do you do the pictures? Uh, you can just hit, hit that to four. Right there to forward that. So. Okay. After or good morning. So we'll go. Okay. Uh, mental conditioning. So uh, to me, there are two parts to a hunt. First, the physical aspect of being in good enough shape to keep hunting, and second, maybe more important, the mental part of the hunt. In the beginning of a hunt, there is more to the physical side. But as a person has to keep going is where being in mental shape becomes more important. Make a, okay, make a commitment to as much time as you can during the season, which will help keep the stress level to a minimum. Often hunters will put extra pressure on themselves because it is a sheep or goat hunt, something only other people get to do. I remember when I drew, you know, going to the mailbox, doing the backflip, watching even how I drove for two months, making sure that I didn't do anything. Uh, had a Steens tag. We scouted uh, two, three times, uh, all always in the same area. And all the other tag holders were also working that same area. So after opening day, it was like we were starting over again. I had to learn the area. This is where scouting really helps by learning the unit and how to access the remote areas, <coughs> excuse me, and identify as many potential shooter rams as possible. I find scouting extremely rewarding as you establish plans A, B, and C. Our son drew a sheep tag for the Alvord Peak, Catlow Ram, Alvord Desert units thank you and before before that hunt we uh, went over every weekend after work seven weekends in a row drove the 10 hours uh, so bef before the season we had he had 14 days in I stayed the last week and I had 21 days before the se season uh, we had our rams located. Opening day, the uh, wind wasn't right. We laid back, and then the next morning, we went in and we took one of our target rams. Make sure you're, you have gear and clothing for all kinds of weather, from too hot to too to extreme cold. Also make sure your boots are properly broken in. If you are physically miserable, it will affect your mental condition. So, a person must be able to put aside the demands of work and what needs to be done at home. A clean slate is all important. Uh, a few examples, uh, a friend of mine uh, during his sheep hunt was his wife's birthday. He went home to spend that time with her. He never came back and finished his hunt. I always say you can kiss her later. So uh, We helped on a Snake River hunt and before the season uh, the hunter was saying how he had the whole season. Friday night before openers he started talking about needed to be home and worried about work. Uh, opening morning the only ram that we had located at that time was a small small ram. He shot that ram, and by noon, he was loaded up and heading for home. So, uh, we helped, uh, or I helped uh, converse with a fellow on the on another Snake River, and talking with him, he never hiked while scouting. He just worked off the road, 
and towards the end of his hunt, uh, there's a ewe herd that hangs right on the road, and he shot a little ram out of that uh, out of that herd. So he never he never hiked. Had uh, another good friend. He during his hunt, I, we learned that he was uh, the people that were helping had to get back to work. So he was by himself. We got a wrote a note on a napkin where he was. We actually found him on the road. He was packed up and heading home. We uh, said that we would stop, help uh, take a day off. We'll get organized and get back out and, and hit it. And he said, nope, heading, heading on home. Um, worked with a goat tag holder that lived in my, in my area. And he came over to the house a few times. He, his uh, hunting partners, they always had something to do on weekends. They never got over to scout, and this was Hat Point. And opening morning, and, and they never went over before the hunt. And opening morning, they got over. Uh, his hunting partners looked over the edge, said, not going down there. He shot a one-horned nanny uh, on opening day. And another good another acquaintance from a camp next to us where we elk hunt he he drew we we'll talked to him and i got he was a steens tag he never went over before the season and when you look off the top of the steens it is pretty uh pretty pretty steep intimidating and he he never hunted he turned around and went home so these are examples of allowing yourself to give up. These show how important getting and keeping in mental shape should be. And added a part that actually involves me, so uh, it's mental lapses while goat and sheep hunting. And having scope set on highest power, moving target hard to find. Uh, keep scope on lowest power, you always have time to turn it up. No shell in chamber. Uh, a firing pin does echo. So, not thinking of moving to a better rest, forcing a plan instead of being patient and letting the opportunity to play out. In other words, let the let the sheep or goat decide how you're going to do do the stock and how to hunt it. Judging an animal from the back, you just can't do it taking the needed time to properly judge goat as to sex. So, uh, I tell my hunting partners that the most important job is to make sure that I stay focused. This may be taking a day off to rest, them taking my pack, or simply spending more time glassing, which means less hiking. Remember to enjoy the moment that are giving you. In 205, I uh, hunted stone sheep for 16 days. The hunter booked af after me canceled, so I decided to see about staying another 11 days for a total of 27 days away from home. We hunted as hard on the last day of the hunt as we did on the first day and had a great adventure that I would do again if the opportunity presented itself. Mentally, this was a great hunt for me because I knew home and work was under control and I could concentrate on looking for a good ram. Remember, being mentally prepared should ensure a more enjoyable hunt and increase your odds of success. Thank you. Who's next? Thanks, Don. I was waiting for the uh, next slide to come up. You jumped out on me early, sorry about that. Our, uh, our next speaker today, this is one of the, the presentations that I always appreciate the most at this orientation. You know, I think every sheep hunter after their hunt will step back and go, I wish I would have thought of X, right? And as we've all had those thoughts going through a sheep hunt, we, we reach out every year and we ask the, one of the previous year's sheep hunters to come up and talk about those moments. What during their hunt was the aha time? What did they not think of ahead of time going into their hunt? So 
the gentleman that's, that's volunteered to come out and share their experiences today is Taylor Skinner. Um, I want to thank Taylor. He jumped off the fire line with all the current ongoing fires to come talk to us today. Um, he had a tag last year in the White Horse and um, spent his time eight days in the field out looking for rams. And uh, he's going to share with us some of the experiences that he had and, and what his aha moments were. So, Taylor. So, forward, backward, you can use the keys. Okay. Can do All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I just want to say uh, congratulations, to everybody that drew a tag. I remember the excitement um, very well. Um, the position you guys are in right now so um, like you said my name is Taylor Skinner I had the East White Horse sheep tag last year and uh, this is kind of going to be based on my perspective of kind of a desert hunt but I think it's going to kind of pertain to a lot of the hunts as well so um, first thing I want to kind of talk about is uh, expectations um, when I kind of first started pouring over maps and kind of looking at the access there um, and I actually got over there, it was a lot different than I kind of expected or thought it would be. So just kind of be ready for things to not be um, what you think they should be. Um, in this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but there's um, 17 rams in there. And uh, that day I also saw another band of 12 rams. And that was the very first day I went out scouting. So I... Uh, I was like, man, this is going to be easy. And as I went, it um, definitely was not that easy. I spent three more days before I saw another sheet. So then my next three days scouting. So just uh, be ready that, you know, things may change. You know, you, you expect something to be one way and then it's going to be different. And then on to my hunt. Um, um, it may not go the way that you see it going so just just be prepared for that um, it's not not that it's going to be um, um, bad but it may not be the way you see it going so just be prepared for um, adversity as well um, just getting to the hunt um, if you have any uh, mechanical issues with your vehicle flat tires um, all that stuff can happen. Um, the ram in this uh, picture here um, was the one that I was looking for, and I spent five days looking for him. I thought I was, you know, just going to go over and find him, and it didn't work out that way. I probably hiked 25, 30 miles um, looking for him. Um, spent probably equal amount of hours glassing, and um, I I never found him. So just um, be prepared for n not a uh, not seeing um, or finding what you are looking for. And then also just um, leading up to the hunt, um, I had you know quite the journey. Um, as most of you know that live in Oregon, we had the, um, all those fires last year in September and I had the second season. So I was leaving, supposed to leave on a Friday and all the fires started on a Monday night. And like you said, I'm a wildland firefighter so not only was I out on the fires, but I was evacuated from my house. So I ended up actually leaving two weeks later than I was supposed to leave for my hunt. So, um, and then on top of that, a lot of my friends that were supposed to come, they couldn't come just because things changed. So um, just be prepared for things that, you know, aren't, uh, aren't what you expect to happen. Some of the wishes, regrets that I had on the hunt and for the most part, I was like pretty happy with how it went, but um, because I didn't have many people to come with me, is basically my wife and uh, my dad with the, me on the hunt most of the time. Um, I just wish I would have taken more video of the hunt. Um, had somebody that you know, a cameraman that could have kind of documented a little more. And I also wish I would have kept a journal scouting and uh, um, and on the hunt, just just to kind of look back at it. And probably the, the most important thing that I wish I would have had is um, more pictures with um, people on my hunt. Um, this picture here is um, my son 
and it's one of the few that I actually have of people. I, I have tons of pictures of country and sheep, but I just, I never stopped to take pictures with people or the people with me. So I wish I would have had more of those. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but um, just be prepared for the weather, um, especially in the desert. You can have massive temperature swings. Um, the picture on the left, it says 107 degrees. And that was, um, it was actually it was 110 that day. And that, this is probably 6 p.m. And then the next morning it was 42 degrees at 5 a.m. So um, you go from wanting to be in shorts and no shirt to being bundled up and a big puffy and long john. So um, just be prepared for that. And then also a lot of these hunts are in the summertime. So um, thunderstorms happen out in the desert. And if you ever spend any time over there, those roads, once they get wet or um, can be impassable. So just be pre prepared for that and being in there. Um, um, have a plan to get out or stay if you have to, because um, sometimes you might not be able to get out of where you're at. And then the last thing is, um, we kind of talked about it earlier in the presentations, but um, it's hot over there and um, there's generally little shade. So um, make sure you have plenty of water. Um, I kind of learned that the hard way. One of the first days I hiked probably 10 miles, I got pretty dehydrated. So just make sure you pack lots of water and are prepared for that. And <clears throat> so a UTV or ATV I think is almost a must in a lot of those desert hunts. Um, it's those roads or a lot of those are just two tracks. Somebody started driving across the desert and uh, that's where the road began. So there's, they're not rocked, they're not graded, um, and they're oftentimes pretty rough. So a truck is super slow going and you can do it, not that you can't. Um, some of the other hunters that I had um, on my hunt, they had pickups and they were able to do it with a truck, but um, they both expressed that they wished that they had had a ATV or side-by-side. So um, either buy one, borrow one, rent one, whatever you can, but I think that um, having an ATV or UTV is super important. And I would say it definitely made a difference on my hunt. Um, I spotted um, my ram clear across the canyon and uh, it took me an hour and a half to drive around and that was on my side by side and it probably would have taken me closer to two and a half hours in a truck. And uh, so I, I caught them coming up just in time when, right when I got there. So I would not have uh, got my ram if it wasn't for having uh, side by side. I would say get in shape. They uh, obviously the last presentation touched on it a lot, but uh, just be in the best shape that you can. Um, it's going to make a difference on your hunt, whether it's hiking up a hill or, you know, packing the animal out, going into places. Um, he had all those stories of these people walking over and looking over and they said, nope, I'm not going to do it. So just make sure that you're prepared for that. And uh, a lot of that country is rugged. So just make sure that you're ready for that. Um, Fortunately for my job, you know, I have to work out for it, but um, I definitely worked out a little extra last year and made the uh, workouts a little longer. So the more you can hike and the more success you're going to have or the better odds of success you're going to have. So um, I spent a lot of miles walking and I, um, it really paid off for me. We kind of touched on this earlier as well, but just don't be afraid to ask for information. Um, like you said, everybody kind of has their secret deer or elk spots, but um, with these once a lifetime tags, people are um, generally willing to help. So um, obviously you'll get to talk with a biologist. Um, they'll give you general areas, but you know, they're not going to give you coordinates on where sheep are at and they, they can't because they move around a lot, but just pay attention to those areas. And I found sheep in pretty much every area that the biologist showed me. So. Um, they're not going to steer you wrong. Um, talk to previous tag holders. Um, a lot of them are super willing to help. Um, I talked to some people that they were even willing to come on my hunt, but because of the circumstances that they couldn't come with all the fires. But um, I had somebody that had a tag, never met the guy in my life, and he wanted to come over. So just talk to people. Uh, most people are pretty willing to help. And if you have social media, reach out. I had people I never knew on social media gotten contact with me after you know friends of mine um, had seen that I drew the tag and um, people actually got a hold of me and gave me information so don't be afraid and then last um, talk with like the local people or ranchers over there I had a rancher that um, he 
showed me where every water hole that was kind of hidden was on a map. Um, so a lot of them are also willing to help. Um, optics, I would say just have the best you can afford or can um, take with you. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time glassing. So just make sure that you have um, good optics. Um, I would say a spotting scope is almost a must. Um, I know it's kind of hard to see, it's pretty impossible to see on the picture on the left, but it's basically a rock wall and there's, um, it's really hard to see, but there's a ram and a ewe and a lamb bedded down in the middle of the rocks. So um, I looked with my binoculars and I couldn't see it. And then when I pulled my spot and scope out, I spotted them. So um, I would say having a decent spotting scope is almost a must. Um, and then the picture on the right was um, also hard to see, but that was over a mile away and uh, which made a difference and actually the ram I ended up shooting was um, in that group but and then also get a phone scope or similar product um, that way you can take pictures and you can go back and look at um, your sheep or goat or whatever tag you have and you can kind of compare and you can um, you know a ram that I thought was good at the beginning and after I you know started seeing a lot of rams I realized wasn't as good so um, just kind of take pictures and that way you can compare and then um, that way you can you know judge and decide what kind you like um, on the scouting I would say take as many trips as you can over there I know um, it can be a long drive and it's definitely not cheap fuel uh, feels um, very expensive right now but um, with my job I didn't have much time off but um, I generally would get two days off, so I'd get off work, drive through the night, and I'd get there about daylight, scout for a little bit in the morning, take a nap, scout at night, scout the next day, and then I'd drive through the night home and go back to work. So um, it was rough, but um, I'm really glad that I actually took the time to do it. So um, I found areas that um, had rams, and I was kind of prepared and knew the area for going over there. And while you're scouting, I'd say pay attention to where the rams and ewes hang out. Like their um, areas generally overlap, um, but they have kind of specific areas they like to hang out. Um, you're probably going to see the ewes more in the rocky country, and the rams are going to be more in the rim rock, open grassy stuff. So just pay attention to that. And then um, kind of with the phone scope, take lots of pictures, um, compare. Um, the sheep, they have lots of different genetics, so they come in different shapes and sizes. So find the, what appeals to you and um, focus on trying to get a good rep representation, you know, of that species. <clears throat> you know, I, I wanted one that was, you know, kind of had longer horns and kind of had its lamb tip still and was wide. And some people want, you know, broomed off heavy ram. So everybody has their preference, but if you take lots of pictures, you can kind of start um, deciding what you um, like to or what you want to go after and finally i'll just say it's your hunt you drew the tag you get to do it um it is what you make it don't put pressure on yourself um, i kind of unduly put pressure on myself just kind of with my situation going over there and i was you know trying to get it done because i had half the time i thought i was going to have for the hunt but decide what's most important for you on your hunt um, do you just want to have a relaxed fun relaxed fun hunt and just get an animal is that important to you um, is score important to you um, um, getting with a bow or a muzzleloader is that important to you or you know you do want a certain look to the animal just decide what you want and I mean you don't have to decide right now but um, as you're over there scouting um, decide what's important to you and then uh, finally I just want to say um, have fun uh, most of us that drew this tag or me last year and you guys this year you'll never get to have this chance again so um, enjoy it while you can and uh, good luck everybody thanks Taylor and you know with any of our speakers if, if you hear something that you want more information on everybody's going to be around all day so please you know think about those questions um, catch them on the side. Also, don't hesitate at the end. You know, we're up here to try to help you as much as we can. 
So if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand. We can try to get those answered. A lot of times, you know, there may be four or five people in the room thinking the same thing. And that's been one of the benefits to this orientation in the past, is bringing everybody together and hearing the questions from one another kind of helps put us all in a better spot as we start to prepare for our hunt. So next up, I know the, the agenda says break. We're running a little bit ahead, so we're gonna go ahead and take our next presentation and then we'll get a break after that. Um, next up, we have Andy Weibel. Uh, Andy's been active with Oregon Finance throughout the years. Um, his family's had a taxidermy shop. He's spent a lot of time caring and preserving for people's trophies over the years. And he's gonna share some of his thoughts on field techniques of how to make sure that your trophy comes back from the field in the best condition possible to, to make it ready for your taxidermist. Good morning. Um, congratulations on the tag holders out there. Um, it's pretty special. Um, so yeah, like Jeremy said, I'm here to talk to you about uh, taking care of your animal in the field. Um, some of you guys are gonna, guys and gals might have more challenges than others depending on where you're at, but um, it's mostly all the same principles, you know. The critical thing is getting heat out of it and not screwing up the hair. So, um, begin with, uh, if you have to move your animal, if you get it down in some place that's awkward, um, avoid dragging the animal. You know, um, dragging will just rip the hair right off and that's not really a repairable thing. Um, it's surprising how fast it can happen too and how easy it can happen. I've seen people who, who wrapped their thing up and all that and thought it was protected and, or they had two people carrying it and some part of it was dragging while they were suffering through hauling the thing, you know, and, and then there's a bald spot. So as best you can, try to, try to take care of it where it lays. Um, if you, you know, if you have to pick it up, if you can, put it on something, uh, if you have to drag it. Begin skidding it as soon as you can. You know, you're gonna take pictures, you're gonna this and that, right? But um, again, the name of the game is, is getting the heat out of it. And so the sooner you can get it open and get the guts out of it, uh, the better the chance of, of your sheep coming back intact. So, um, I'll talk to you about the tools here. Um, what you see there on the screen, or what you don't see there on the screen. <laughs> um, this is what I use. This is the basic stuff I would take. Um, and it's not fancy. Uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of good gear out there. There's a lot of things you can spend your money on, right? And, but um, for, for my money in the shop when I was doing this, uh, these are my knives, you know? Um, and they are all food service knives, and they're cheap. This is my favorite knife, it's $4. Um, now, you know, it's like with guns, I think, whatever, the right tool is the one you know how to use, right? But um, I like this one a lot. It's a sheep's foot. Um, I tend to do most of my work with a point. Um, this one is, if you can see it, it's curved. Uh, this would be my knife I'd use for doing the initial incision, going down the belly. It's good for entering, and then as you're going along, because it's curved, you know, it rides really nicely in the skin for one smooth, long cut, but that's pretty much all you'd use it for. And then I always carry this one. This one's a lot thicker and heavier. Um, it's beefy like a knife you'd keep on your belt, but it's cheap, you know. Um, it's good for, for, yeah, if you gotta like break a joint or something like that. So anyway, um, you can see in the picture, maybe you can see in the picture, a round sharpening stone. I like round sharpening stones. If I drop them, they don't break. Um, I don't really find I have to sharpen very frequently because I don't really need my knife that sharp. I need it sharp enough to, to sort of score. I don't need a scalpel. And I know there's a knife out there that puts scalpel blades in it and you don't have to sharpen it. To me, that's too sharp. Um, I want a knife that if I slip and go thrusting forward, it's not gonna go through everything. I want a knife that will stop, usually, if I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. And then, uh, that's a headlamp. Again, don't know if you can see it. Headlamp and extra batteries. Um, because you do not know what's gonna happen. You don't know what time of day you might shoot this thing. And, you know, you wanna keep yourself equipped to be able to keep going and finish the job if you can, right after you've killed it. So, headlamp, stone, there's a rag there. I, I keep, you know, four or five rags on me. And I'd keep that stuff on me. I wouldn't, uh, 
I wouldn't hand that to a friend. I'd keep that on me. So anyway, that's that. Um, when you're caping, this is a diagram of caping cuts. You can find these kind of diagrams all over the internet. Um, this one in particular goes a little short on the legs. But, um, you know, familiarize yourself with the basic cuts for, for a shoulder mount, if that's what you want to do. If you folks are interested in a life size or something bigger, you might talk to your taxidermist about where your taxidermist wants to have you cut it. Um, some taxidermists prefer a cut up the belly, some prefer a cut up the back. You know, it just depends. You know, in all things, if you have to choose between listening to me and listening to a taxidermist you're going to end up working with, listen to the taxidermist you're going to end up working with. Remove as much meat from the hide as you can. Um, this is not usually a problem, but it can be, particularly on neck meat. Um, there's some big pieces of muscle along the sides. You've probably seen them on deer and elk and whatnot. When you have, you know, couple inches of meat sitting on the hide, that can continue to trap heat against the skin. Um, and you can end up potentially with a hair slip, uh, a bald patch in one of those areas because of that. So, you know, once you get the thing off, going back, going back at camp, whatever, um, and getting that extra meat off of there is a real good idea. Especially if you were going to try to salt it or something like that. Because if you salt over a big thick piece of meat, all you're making is a piece of jerky on top of the hide, right? You're not actually helping the hide. Um, if you can, and most of you will be able to, leave the skinning of hooves and head, the head to a taxidermist. That stuff's delicate. And um, aside from the horns, it's what most people look at. You know, so a mistake that leaves you with you know, no eyelid is pretty visible. A problem with the nose is pretty visible, you know. Um, taxidermists do this all, over, all the time, you know, day after day during the hunting season and are pretty, uh, pretty good at doing that. And there's some weird stuff. When you get into an eye, it's stretchy as heck, you know, and it, sometimes it's hard to know where you're even at on it when you're working on it. So, you know, best to leave that be. If you need to do that, if you feel like, you know, if you're floating or something and you need to really take care of it yourself, talk to your taxidermist and get instruction on how to do that. I would tell you generally, if you have to do the head, take more than you think you need to. Go deeper on the eye, go deeper in the nose, you know, go deeper on the mouth. Um, when, when somebody does it themselves, more often than not, there's cut lips and there's missing pieces of eyelid. So, anyway. There you go, ask your taxidermist how best to cut the cape for what you want. Um, there's a surprising variety of things you can get. In fact, you can probably get anything. You could get two sheep stacked on top of each other if you want to. Anyway, whatever. I mean, you know, taxidermists will cut these forms apart, do whatever you want, right? So find out if you've got an idea what you want, find out what they need you to bring them. Okay, once you got the thing off, um, I would do this immediately. I'd lay it out. You know, now you're not going to necessarily find shade, but first thing you do is lay that thing out. Once you got the cape off of it and now you're working on the meat, you're working on the gutting, whatever, you know, you get that laid out, open, let the breeze blow across to get it cooling. When you get back to camp, lay it out again. Um, someplace in the shade, best you can. Um, when you're moving it around, if you're packing it back to camp, deer bag, burlap sack, something like that. This is to protect I mean, it does more than one thing, but for me, it protects the hair. It protects the hair from the ropes and the straps you might tie the thing up with. You know, it, if you bundle the thing up with the hair out and tie some twine around it, you might end up with some nice little twine-sized stripes through your, through your animal. Yeah, plastic bags are no bueno. Um, the only time you'd use a plastic bag is going into the freezer. And uh, yeah, they're just like a little greenhouse. Um, they're good for garbage, but they're not good for your cape. Let's see. And that goes, honestly, that goes for, uh, that goes for other things too. You know, um, we had, not me, my father had a customer who, uh, they were floating and they shot their sheep on the first day. And they didn't want to waste the trip, right? A bunch of friends together. And I guess they fished the rest of the way out, right? Instead of just hauling butt out of there and put their sheep in a black duffel bag, which ought to be breathable. But that was a, that was a destroyed sheep, you know. By the time they got out, it was just rotten. Yeah, if you can, if you want to, um, 
if you're not busy drinking beer and telling stories, uh, get some water out and brush any blood off of the hair that you can find. Uh, the most persistent blood usually is gonna be right around the bullet hole and, you know, entry or exit. There's not, you don't have to sit there and scrub until it's bald, right? Um, that kind of stuff we either cut out or, or you can kind of sometimes peroxide it and get to, to, to ease up. But, you know, if you have blood sitting on the thing just from handling it, just rinse it off. It's not gonna hurt anything to, to do that. If you feel like it, you don't have to do this necessarily. Um, but if you feel like your animal is maybe at risk, if it's really hot out, whatever, you know, you can salt the animal. Um, with the cape attached to the head, you can salt it. Uh, you want to use a non-iodized salt. I'm not a chemist, but I've been reliably told this by tanneries and other people. You want non-iodized salt. We would in the shop use stock feed salt. We get it on pallets, you know, and, and it's great, kind of a heavy grain. Table salt, it's really fine. It's, it's, it's hard to break it off, you know. But when you're salting, you put salt on it, it draws moisture out, you know, next day you brush the salt off, you put new salt on. If you use table salt, you can't get it off. If you use rock salt, big heavy stuff, and some people do, uh, it doesn't have the same surface contact. You want something like a stock salt, and you can get it in a grocery store as canning and pickling salt if you know the right grocery store. I don't know. It's certainly cheaper to buy a sack of, so rocks, or sack of uh, stock salt you know, at a feed store. Um, about, about two quarts probably would be uh, adequate to take in the field. Um, yeah, if you salted it, uh, you can hang it up to drip after doing so. Um, you don't want to just like lay it down or fold it up necessarily and let it just stew in the, in the liquid that comes out of it, you know. Um, well, you do that first, sorry. You actually, you bundle it up and sit there. After a little bit, two hours, you, you hang it up, let it drip, put another layer of salt on it. Um, that's the kind of thing we do at the shop. We do on an overnight cycle. But if you're in the field, you can do it a little quicker than that. You don't want to dry it to the point that it's like a board. You know, you need it to be somewhat pliable uh, for your tax to work on it, mostly because tax owners wants to see what's there, wants to be able to unfold it, and then wants to be able to package it up and send it to a tannery. So we wouldn't, even in the shop, we wouldn't salt it and dry it to the point that you couldn't move the thing unless we had it in its final package shape that's going off to a tannery. But I don't think you could achieve that, honestly. I think that'd be pretty tough. That'd take days for you guys to dry it that much. Um, yeah, as soon as you can get it on ice, you know, forget the salt, <laughs> as soon as you can get it on ice, that's, that's that's the best thing. Um, you know, uh, getting it in somebody's refrigerator or a freezer, getting it in an ice chest with ice packs, whatever you gotta do, um, that's, that's ideal. You know, it's better for the tax nurmers to have the thing come in, honestly, unsalted, fresh, cold, you know, and, and it's just all there, lay it out, you can see everything, get to work. Um, so again, salt is for if you need it. You feel like you need it. If you're frightened of whatever the heck it is, and that could be me too, right? Um, but, you know, if you can get it out of the field into a refrigerator or freezer, you can't beat that. If you do go into a freezer, that's the time to use the plastic bag because the freezer will freeze to the hair on the animal. And then you go try to get it out of the freezer and a bunch of hair stays behind. So, you know, if you're going to go into a freezer or refrigerator, bag that thing up transport it to the tax dermis as soon as possible. That's just it. We're sitting around day and night, you know, during this time of year, just hoping somebody will come by with a bloody mess for us to deal with, and most of you will oblige, and uh, that's awesome. Yeah, pack it on ice for the trip. This is, again, I'll tell you another story. I know I tell these stories, I hope the people that are about aren't here. But uh, we had the, 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 the most memorable time a sheep went bad when I was working at the shop was a sheep that was shot in the Steens Mountains and late at night and they left it overnight and leaving it overnight didn't gut it first this is why I bring a headlamp right I bring an energy bar whatever right I want to stay there I want to make it comfortable for myself I'll bring knee pads you know <laughs> make myself a little place to live and work on this freaking animal till it's done right but they left it overnight. Everybody's probably done that at some point. But uh, ungutted, unopened, left it. Came back with horses, packed it out. Drove it to Redmond in the trunk of like a car. 
left it overnight unrefrigerated, drove it up to us in Portland. And there was a patch on the neck about this big that was bald. Just hair just pulls right out, just like when you find a carcass out in the woods. You know, just the hair is just everywhere. And there's nothing you can do about that. You know, we take, you know, we like hang it over something, took a hose and just started like finding all the bald spots. And there were many. Now that thing got mounted, believe it or not, but it's, I think what we did was, we didn't actually do that in the end, but they uh, shifted the bald spot around the back of the animal so it was against the wall, right? But, you know, um, I can tell you a sheep cape is an expensive replacement. It's better if you have your own. I imagine you folks are all here because you want your own sheep, right? If you didn't care about getting your own sheep, you go buy it in Montana or something, already mounted, you know, and you wouldn't care. Most people don't do that. You want your own sheep. And these animals, they, they, their character, their life is in their face and in their, their horns. You know, they're all banged up. Their nose has got, you know, things over here, you know, scars on them, all this. You know, they, they're, they're, their head's a weapon, you know. They, the whole story's right there in their face. You'd replace the cape, you got a different animal, different story. You know, it's no longer really your animal, and it's pretty easy to see that. It's not so, so easy to see that on an antelope or a deer or an elk. Um, but on a sheep it is, I think. So do the best you can, you know, bring it home intact. Now here's some examples of tax remounts. Um, you know, a couple years ago, I was seeing more and more people were just getting the skull cleaned and, and getting the cape tanned, and I don't know what they were doing, but you know, that's, that's a valid option. Um, shoulder mounts, look at that nice sheep. Look at that beautiful sheep, where's Tim Valentine? Is he hiding somewhere? Whatever. There's a guy here, that's his sheep. It's a beautiful sheep out of Snake River. Um, you can get a shoulder mount with habitat. That antelope's got a little bit of rocky stuff around it. I don't know if, yeah, never mind. <laughs> God. We gotta get blinds in here. Uh, wall pedestal mounts, that's a mount. It's like a shoulder mount, but the animal's tipped out a little bit. It looks a little bit nicer, you know? It'll have a curved kind of thing on it and some leather in the back, you know, I, I don't, Jeremy, do we have this presentation somewhere where they can actually look at it? Okay, all right. Yeah, you can peruse through these things. They're just examples of things you can get, you know. Sometimes a person doesn't, doesn't think, oh, I'd like to get that until after it's all over because they didn't see the example. So that's why I have these in here. Um, pedestal mounts, this is a pedestal mount. You can get a mount like this that just goes on a tabletop called a table pedestal. Um, wouldn't have the whole box underneath it. It would just have the habitat and some sort of little thing to sit on the table. You know, it's going to be determined a lot by what kind of real estate you have in your house. Um, all the way up to life size, half a life size, floor standing, wall. You know, there's, there's a lot of choices. You know, talk to your taxidermist, really go through it. Decide what you, what you feel like you can afford and what you want to put into this. Um, you probably aren't going to do this a second time. So, you know, it might be worth a little stretch. Anyway, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything, about uh, whatever? Oh, wow, you guys are confident. I love it. All right, cool. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for your attention, and good luck in your hunts. And, uh, yeah, take care. I'll be around if you have any questions later. Yeah, and that's an important note. You know, Andy's a wealth of knowledge. He's no longer in the taxidermy business unless he's jumped back in, and I didn't know about it. So, you know, good neutral source to ask those questions. The other thing I think, you know, I hear Andy say in his presentation, it's great to reiterate is, if you're gonna have taxidermy work done, make sure you've made some of those contacts ahead of time and you've talked to your individual taxidermist about their expectations and what they want. Everybody's gonna have a little bit of a different approach to how they do their work. Um, we're gonna take a break. Um, this is the moment where we're gonna ask those of you with a mountain goat tag. Um, here, we're gonna have about a 20 minute break. We'll extend it out. Um, give you an opportunity to get cookies, coffee, um, look at some sheep heads, talk to some bios on the side if you want. All of our, sh all of our mountain goat tag holders, we're going to ask you to go up the stairs right outside this door. Um, we'll break out and do the mountain goat orientation after the break up there. Our sheep hunters will all stay down here. Um, before we do that, uh, Marcus with Oregon for Nas has a couple quick words he'd like to share with us and then we'll break out. Hi folks. Uh, congrats to everyone, first and foremost. Uh, I'm one of the board members at Oregon Finaz. Uh, we are co-hosting this event in conjunction with uh, ODF&W. 
uh, my uh, committee assignments and what I do is hound you guys via email and through the internet to come here. So thank you guys for showing up. I appreciate it. Uh, the organization does as well. Uh, my second facet at Oregon uh, FNAS is membership. So I've seen a couple of folks already sign up for their free annual. Uh, in your pamphlets as tag holders that were given to you when you showed up, there's a step-by-step -step on how to go through and get your first year free with us at Oregon FNAS. Uh, you'll be in tune on a lot of our uh, projects we work on, weed chops, uh, timber cutting, uh, habit restoration, uh, habitat restoration, things like that. So stay in touch with us. Uh, come to our banquet, have a good time. We're also doing a lot more social events uh, now that the pandemic has cooled down. Uh, so stay in touch with us there. Uh, we'll have pub nights. Um, we're looking at doing some uh, fall events or winter events. So uh, stay in touch and go through that on your membership. What else am I missing? Oh, this uh, presentation. So it is very tough to see what's on the screen here. Um, we know that. We are recording this entire thing. Uh, and my Sunday night and probably, probably a little bit of Monday will be editing this. Um, and putting it on YouTube. All of the presentations will be on there clear as day. I will take the PowerPoints and put them on there uh, with their respective speakers. So if you are missing something or really wanna go back and see something, it will be on YouTube and I will be emailing it to everyone who RSVP'd for the event uh, and all the tag holders. So if there's something you wanna go back and look at, that will be online um, and you will be able to see it clear as day. So thank you guys. Okay, yep, so if everybody wants to grab a cup of coffee, uh, mountain goat hunters can start wandering upstairs and we'll come back together in 20 minutes with sheep tag holders down here to go through the next round. Thank you.